associate campus pastor here. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you. Um, welcome to our visitors that are here today. Let's have a hand for them. Great. And we're, we're kind of squeezing people in. So if you are um, in some of these seats and there's middle seats, if you can just kind of slide in together, that would be really helpful as more people are still coming in. So today is a first Friday. All right. Yeah, and for today's first Friday, just in case you haven't heard, there's going to be an eclipse on Monday. And so because of that, our first Friday is going to be all about the eclipse. We've got moon pies, we've got eclipse glasses, maybe some sunny D down there as well. So right after chapel, be sure to make your way to the hub and grab some of that fun stuff, okay? Thanks for being here today. Good morning. How are we doing? Good. Anybody else just like so tired? <laughs> I feel like I'm just exhausted all the time and it's fine. It's going to be fine. We're almost done. But this morning I wanted to, we're going to sing some songs. They're not super upbeat, but there's some favorites. So if that's you and you're tired and you just need to take a break and release everything that is like weighing you down, just release it at the feet of Jesus, by all means do that. I'm going to invite you to stand if you want to go for it if you are more comfortable or if you want to take some time in prayer maybe on your knees or seating um, be be completely free to do that you you can stand if you want you can sit I just I want to give you some time to take a breath and just rest at the feet of your creator so we're gonna we're gonna sing a couple songs and yeah
Father, thank you for giving us the ability to approach your throne boldly, even when all we have to say is hallelujah, when we have nothing left to give and nothing that expresses how worthy you are and how holy you are, and all we can do is sit there and say hallelujah. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that intercedes for us with groanings who knows what we need to say when we don't have the words for it. Lord, thank you for your ultimate sacrifice coming off of Easter and
And the song that we sang on Tuesday about never losing the wonder of what you've done, Lord. I pray that you renew our hearts, that you give us new eyes to see how amazing you are and your presence that is all around us. Lord, we are so grateful for what you've done and we can never earn it. We can never do anything to make up for it. It is purely a gift. And Lord, I pray for those of us that haven't received that gift, that you would soften our hearts and just let us accept it. The only place that we can find life is in you, Lord. And we just thank you for being closer than our breath, closer than our thoughts. We just love you a lot. Amen. All right, well, thank you, Jay Noise. Appreciate you leading us in worship. And it's good to be together. It's good to be together. Uh, I'm Mark Vincenti, the other uh, campus pastor, and uh, I know we have some guests. I want to say welcome. Glad you are here. And uh, I'm excited about today's speaker, somebody that uh, our students certainly know and love, and uh, some of us alum know and love as well. Dr. Dwight Brodingham came to Huntington in 1987. Uh, having received a Ph.D. in British and Early Modern European History from the University of Rochester, and specializes in 17th century English political and religious history. Um, he has published a lot of stuff that's really smart and awesome, okay? Um, and uh, you just need to know that. Um, but something that uh, I think is most significant for me, um, I as much as I appreciate your intellect and um, respect all that you've done in your field, is as a freshman, uh, Dr. Brodingham, you were my freshman mentor in our group. And I was really wrestling with what my calling in life was. I didn't know where God was leading. I didn't, and I remember um, Dr. B had us over to the house, and we're sitting on the front porch, and I'm trying to figure out, should I pursue drumming and music? Should I pursue ministry? Um, what, should I, what should I do? Where was God leading me? And you didn't give me the answer. But you sat and listened, and you helped me to figure out what it looks like to be in that process with God and in community with other people who cared. And I deeply appreciate that. I know that many other students have a similar story as mine, and uh, you've mentored a lot of us. But you've also uh, had some very creative teaching styles and methods uh, that s I heard a little kind of some laughter filtering throughout. Um, and where, where, well, I don't have to talk much about it, uh, but where students are competing against each other. Uh, they're trying to figure out what it actually looks like to live out some of these principles that you say in class, and it's been really fun hearing those stories as well. So we all appreciate you. We love you. We know this is your last uh, lecture up front here as a professor as you're moving toward retirement, so we're so blessed that you would share with us today. Would you give us, give, give it up for Dr. Bright Brodingham. Thank you for that introduction. Am I on? Oh, good. Um, I can be loud, but I'd rather not. Um, 45 years ago, I was a senior at a small Christian college, a lot like this one, about to graduate, and there were a lot of things I did not know. I did know some things, some very important things. I knew God was my Lord and Savior. I had a favorite Bible verse that I had uh, gotten um, attached to during my college years. I'm going to share it with you because I want to refer to it again, and I want you to keep it in mind. It's uh, Psalm 62.5. And in the New, Internet, or the New American Standard Bible, which was basically in 1979 the Bible that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, <laughs> um, at least for some of us. And it goes like this. It's not very long. It says, my soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. Um, I also think God does awesome things because that theme came out in the, in the music that you guys chose to share today. Um, I almost put in a request, and I just thought, nope, I'm just going to see what God is going to do, and God did God things, so... That's pretty awesome. Um, so there I was, you know, 
not far from graduation. Are there any people in the room that are feeling that pressure a little bit right now? Um, and I did not, what, did not know what I was going to do after I graduated. Uh, that was one of the big I did not knows. Um, and all of the other things. Um, so the question for today and the title of my talk really is, how did I get here? Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about because it turns out God was faithful. He knew things that I didn't know and he worked through the I don't knows. And all I needed to do was to be silent and put my hope in him. Um, and being silent is difficult for me. Some of you uh, know that pretty well. Um, uh, my wife's here, Natalie. No comments, please, on that one. Um, uh, so anyway, I graduated um, not knowing what I was going to do and not knowing things that were coming. And uh, one of the things that influenced me profoundly, even more than I realized at the time, but looking back, I really understand much better, was that three weeks to the day after I graduated from college with some very, very good friends that I made, uh, many of them still really good friends, um, one of my best friends from fifth grade all the way through college was in a canoe race, and the canoe flipped, and he didn't come up. He drowned. His partner was fine in the race, but he was not. Um, that'll rock your world, uh, and it rocked my world, and I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know his dad was going to call me the next day and say, would you be a pallbearer? I didn't know, and I didn't know, I didn't know what to say. I, I just said, God, what is happening? What are you doing? Um, but that shaped me. I'll always think of Bruce as that 22-year-old, strong, young guy. You know, he didn't grow old and get knee pains and all the other things that people my age have. Um, but um, I didn't. I didn't know what that meant, but, but I think subconsciously that made me realize that whatever I'm going to do with my life, it better count, because you don't know how long you have. Later that summer, I was working a summer maintenance job at a ski resort near my house, uh, my parents' house, where I grew up um, in western New York State. And I was on lunch break, and it was a beautiful day. If you've ever been to western New York in the summer, it's God's country. God goes elsewhere in the, other, in the winter. Um, but it was just gorgeous, and I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I don't know. What am I going to do? I'm not going to work at a ski resort on the maintenance crew the rest of my life. And this sentence came into my head, and it wasn't audible, but it said, you could be a college professor. And I thought, how do you do that? <laughs> I don't even know where to start. So, but it was clear. It was the clearest thing that God has ever said to me, I think. And so I said, okay. So I wrote to my old advisor at college and said, okay, I think I want to <laughs> be a college professor. Well, what do I do? You know, and I want to do history. I loved history. Um, some of you were shocked the other day when I mentioned to you I was also a math minor, um, but history was the thing. So she wrote back and said, here's what you do. So I did all the steps, and I applied to some places, and I had a, a really good college friend who was going to seminary in Kentucky at Asbury Theological Seminary, and I wrote to him and said, hey, this is what's going on. I'm thinking, I'm gonna, I'm thinking about going to grad school, and he wrote back and said, apply down here at the University of Kentucky. So we can be close to each other. And I'm like, okay. Well, I did that. Applied to five places the other night. I was trying to remember all five of them. I can only think of one other besides the University of Kentucky. Uh, I got into them all, but the one that made me the best financial offer, and money was important because I didn't have any, um, <laughs> was, believe it or not, the University of Kentucky. So I went there in the fall of 1980. Um, Started my program, uh, started looking for people to connect to. Uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship was very helpful. And in fact, before classes even got started, I went to uh, an inter InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Labor Day picnic, and I met a young lady there. 
She's sitting in the fourth row. Um, but um, she was involved in some kind of relationship with somebody else, and so I enjoyed meeting her. But eventually, in the course of time and talking to other people and so forth, I ended up starting to attend the church that she was already going to. And um, this is the, for those of you who are in my 130 Civ class a few weeks ago when we were talking, you asked me for relationship advice. <laughs> this is the part of this talk where you can get that. Um, so we were at the same church. Um, we got to know each other better. And, and then um, one day uh, on a Sunday after church, it was right basically... I can tell you the exact date, actually. It was February 2nd. It was Groundhog Day. Uh, and she asked me out. There's your relationship advice, ladies. Um, <laughs> guys, if a really amazing, beautiful, smart, godly woman asks you out, say yes. So I did. Um, I'm not always that great on social cues, but I picked that one up. <laughs> <coughs> and our first date was on February 7th, 1981, and we got married on September 5th, 1981. If you know, you know, right? We knew, but more importantly, God knew. My soul waited in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. So, I went to Kentucky, got married, got a master's degree, started figuring out, this is what I think I want to study in my PhD program, and Kentucky wasn't the place, so I had to apply to some other places, and the place that turned out to be the best fit, again, financially, and also really, as it turned out, in terms of the person that became my PhD advisor, was at the University of Rochester. Um, in western New York State, and I grew up in southwestern New York State, so it wasn't that far from family. It was for Natalie, it was further for her, but away we went, um, and when we arrived there, we didn't know all the things that would happen in the next five years. The goal was to get the PhD, that happened, but along the way, we met some great friends. Uh, we were in a couple of different great churches, and, as it turned out, we, uh, in 1985, 39 years ago today, our first daughter was born. It's not at all frightening to me that both of my daughters are older than several of my faculty colleagues. <laughs> <coughs> but that's the case. Um, and by the time I finished my degree, um, or it was almost finished, um, Natalie played another fun part in my life because I saw a job ad in late January uh, for Huntington College in Huntington, Indiana. I had never heard of Huntington College. I'd never heard of Huntington, Indiana. So, and the job ad was pretty vague. It just said history, you know. And <laughs> we're a Christian college, and we need somebody to teach history, and there wasn't much else to it, so I just ignored it. Um, Saw it again two weeks later, and so when I got home, I, I thought I should at least mention this. So I said to Natalie, um, there's this job in history at Huntington College in Huntington, Indiana. And so she got out an atlas. You have, you have to be of a certain age to know what an atlas <laughs> is. Um, but, and, and I was thinking about this again, you know, it's weird to think about a world where there was no internet and no email and all that stuff. You know, you actually had to send letters and all kinds of crazy things. So um, anyway, so she looked it up, and I'll never forget this. She said, oh, you can apply for that job. <laughs> um, and and the, the reality was because she grew up in Northwest Ohio. So somehow a girl from Northwest Ohio and a boy from southwestern New York State met in Kentucky and got married, and God brought all that together and so we would be, if we ended up in Huntington, just two and a half hours or so from her mom, um, who was a widow. Um, I never even met uh, my father-in-law. Uh, he had passed away before I ever met Natalie, actually. So, um, 
So I sent off a letter and said, hey, I'm interested in this job, and I didn't hear anything for a while, and then I got an application in the mail, and I filled that out, and there was a more detailed job description. I'm like, oh, this sounds kind of like fun, you know. Um, and so then I, um, I got a call to come interview on my wife's birthday, and she was seven months pregnant with our second child. Okay, I also had a beard at the time. <laughs> and I did not know what they thought about beards at Huntington College, so I shaved it <laughs> before the interview, um, just in case. I got here, um, one of the first people I met was the late Professor Barlow who had a beard, and I was like, dang. <laughs> uh, didn't need to do that. So anyway, um, I did the interview, and three days later, they called me and offered me the position. Um, so that's how I got here <laughs> to Huntington, um, but of course, there's more after that. So um, we arrived in 1987 um, with a two-year-old and an infant. The two-year-old had stopped napping before we moved to Huntington, and the three-month-old infant didn't really like napping very much. Um, and so here I am with a new job, new house, new community. And Huntington's a wonderful place, but it's a place where a lot of people have lived here for a long time. So when people who didn't grow up here move here, they're, they're outsiders for a while. Um, but I had great colleagues in the history department and I had uh, great colleagues beyond that, and you know, we, we made our way through some of those early adjustments and realized this is a nice place to live and a nice place to raise children, and it was a fun place to be. Uh, Huntington College at the time, was, there was a lot of stuff happening. Um, the building that we're in was not here. There were quite a few buildings that weren't here yet, uh, that are here now. Um, any men here living in Wright Hall? Yeah, when I interviewed, Wright Hall was under construction, and the old Wright Hall was still standing, just barely from what I heard later, but <laughs> <laughs> because they knew it was going to be demolished, they were letting the guys who lived there basically tear it up. Um, a, a, a mentality that apparently carried over to the new Wright Hall. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when I interviewed, the old Wright Hall was there, and when I came back in August, it was gone. That's a little disorienting. Uh, the Lowe building, connected to Lowe Bren, was just starting construction uh, when I came. So my first year, um, I was in a different building, uh, and then moved in there in 1988 into the office that I've been in ever since, which I have to vacate here <laughs> pretty soon. Um, that's going to be weird. Um, but um, the 19, the late 80s, the 90s, lots of interesting things happened. Um, things that I did not know or anticipate. My father passed away in 1991. I was only 34. Seemed like he was gone too soon. Um, but, um, you know, it, was a, it was not, wasn't entirely unexpected, but it was a little sooner than we wanted. Um, a lot of interesting things happened. I had some opportunities for scholarship and some of the things that Mark um, uh, said more nicely than he should have. Um, and then in, late, in the late 1990s, in 1999, um, one of my colleagues retired and God brought to Huntington a new person in the history department, Jeff Webb. Um, almost 25 years now. Um, I didn't know, well, I knew a little bit about what Jeff was going to be like when he cracked a joke during his interview process when he was um, meeting with students and uh, sort of talking through them with things um, and uh, made jokes about foresters tearing down all the trees behind Becker, what's now Becker Hall to build the perimeter road, uh, which our students were all upset about, so they, they thought he was pretty funny too. Um, and then he got into environmental history, which is kind of ironic, I think. Um, <laughs> um, and then we get into the 2000s, and there is something I left out. I, 
by the time we get to 2000 or so, I realized that being a girl dad was a lot of fun, which came with a lot of challenges at the same time, um, but a lot of fun. Um, and then um, something happened in um, the early 2000s that I didn't realize what a big deal it was going to be until later, and that is uh, in the, we used to have a January term here. Um, some of you may have heard of that. Um, and I taught a January term for the first time in January of 2003 on, it's called Hogwarts and Huntington, a class on Harry Potter and Christianity. Um, sorry for those of you who would like to do that. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll find a way to bring it back somehow. But I didn't know how influential that was going to be on me. I ended up doing that class six times, and, or seven, um, but one of the things, and there was somebody that was working with me on this, we decided, oh, just for fun, we'll divide the class up into houses, and we gave them names of HU senior administrators, and we had them compete for a cup, you know, a house cup. Um, and they loved it. I thought, ooh, this is fun. And in fact, every time I did that class, when the class was over, the students and I would all be depressed that we had to go back to regular classes because <laughs> we just had so much fun. Um, but I didn't know how, how to do anything with that. Um, 2003 was also interesting because that summer was when I was diagnosed with the same kidney disease that my father died of. It's a hereditary disease called polycystic kidney disease. Um, and, you know, I knew there was a chance, but I thought, well, I didn't really want to be diagnosed that soon. Um, but it happened. Um, 2007... Um, we, uh, we got approval to hire another person in the history department uh, in uh, non-Western studies. And we ended up interviewing and then convincing this uh, interesting fellow from Great Britain <laughs> to come and join us. And so we got Tim Smith. Um, I know, isn't that great? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know I was going to end up with Webb and Smith. <laughs> what a blessing. Oh, such a great thing. Um, and then, um, you know, things kept happening. Um, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And um, in 2010, uh, my doctor's visits and lab results started showing that I wasn't going to be able to avoid uh, the reality of having to have a kidney transplant. Um, and I thought, oh boy, I don't know what's going to happen here either. But remember, my soul, wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from him. So I was that same year, later that year, having a conversation with uh, one of my brothers. I have three older brothers and a younger sister. She's so blessed. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and the brother who's closest to me in age, and we were very close, we were less than two years apart, so we were, you know, like this all the way through life, really, um, and still are. Um, and we were talking on the phone, and I said, well, it looks like I'm going to have to start planning for a transplant. And he just said, I'll give you a kidney. And I was like, wow. I said, what's your blood type? <laughs> <laughs> he told me it was the right one. Um, and one thing led to another, and in uh, December, as soon as classes were over in 2011, that happened in Indianapolis, and I'm still doing great, and so is he. So, but I didn't know, right? I mean, nobody knows. Um, my dad never even got a chance for a kidney transplant. It was, it was a different time, and, you know, things had changed a lot. So, um, moving forward, other things I didn't know... Um, I should back up here and talk about my daughter who was born 39 years ago. One of the things I didn't know when that happened was that there's a part of you that unlocks when you have a child. I, mean, I just, you know, I loved my wife. I loved, you know, family members and so forth. And then when you have your first baby, there's this whole part of you that has a kind of love that you didn't know existed. And it just opens up. Um, well, that got repeated at a different level in January of 2014 when our first grandchild was born, um, which is one of the reasons I'm retiring. Well, actually, there's three now um, uh, because she has twin siblings that were born in 2016. So, um, 
And so that was a big deal. And then came the fall of 2014, and I was on sabbatical. And, and uh, history teaching was changing a lot. And a lot of the, the really innovative changes were taking place actually in high schools across the country. And so I set out, I'm going to do this sabbatical. I'm going to look at the ways that people are changing their teaching and the cool things that they're doing. And I was probably halfway into that sabbatical when I sort of accidentally ran into this weird thing in college teaching called reacting to the past. And I thought, ooh, that sounds interesting. And then I found out a book had just come out by the guy who started it all. So I ordered that. Uh, that came in. We, uh, we flew to Connecticut where our grandchildren live. Well, it was just the one. She was a baby. At Thanksgiving, and I finished the book on the flight back to Indiana after Thanksgiving. And I remember finishing it, and I turned to Natalie and I said, now I know why the Harry Potter class works. Uh, all of, the, all of the, the, the psychology and the competitiveness and all the things that some of you have been <laughs> subjected to. Um, and it just, I was like, I got to get into this. Um, and then that, um, the following spring, President Emberton announced a, a series of innovation grants for faculty and staff to try to spark things up here around campus. And so I applied for one of those so that I could go to a conference about this pedagogy and learn more about it. And I was blessed enough to receive one of those. And so off I went in June of 2015 to uh, Manhattan uh, for a conference at a very hoity-toity women's college named Barnard College, which is affiliated with Columbia University. Like these are the, you know, the real... Uh, the rich people and all that stuff. Um, but the people I met there, the professors, I remember thinking to myself, you know, once I started experiencing things and getting to know them, I thought, these are my people. <laughs> um, and everybody said, well, you know, if you're going to start doing this, you should just, you know, start slowly and stick your toe in the water. And I thought, no. <laughs> I don't have enough time. <laughs> I'm already past 55. It's time to jump in. So I did. I came home and I changed my book orders with the bookstore and I just threw myself into it. Darn near killed me. Um, but this, it was magic for my students. Um, things were so different. It just changed um, the way that things worked in my classroom and I thought, okay, this is the right thing. And so away we went. Um, and, oh, I'm looking at the clock. I got three minutes. Okay. So, um, but these are all things that I didn't know were going to happen, but God was in them. And, and you know things happen to us that we don't know or expect because you remember the spring of 2020, right? And COVID showed up, and we were like, ugh. Um, and we all had to adjust, and, you know, I hated teaching on Zoom. I think most people did. Um, but we did what we had to do. And then it came time, I got another sabbatical that started in January of 2022. And I had projects to do, work on games, and, and you know, things all planned. And then very early in that sabbatical, we learned, sorry, um, my brother-in-law, my wife's only brother, was diagnosed with pancreatic and liver cancer. Second week of my sabbatical. Um, he was two years younger than we are. Never got a chance to retire. Never got a chance to do a lot of the things that people just plan to do. We didn't know. He didn't know. Um, he made it through most of the year. We were blessed to have a lot of great time with him and his wife, Kathy. Um, they were the, together the siblings that we were closest to of all of our siblings just because of proximity. Uh, two of their sons were students here. Uh, b before they were alumni by this time. Um, and so I had gone on sabbatical as a sort of thought about, okay, um, this is kind of a test run to see if I'd be able to stand being retired. And then that happened, and it makes you think about things. Um, and uh, some other things came along. And so now, anyway, retirement's almost here, and... I'm getting that question, seniors, you're getting it too. What are you going to do? 
And in fact, Dr. Emberton asked me that question recently. <laughs> and the answer is, I have a list, I have some things, but still, I don't know. I know that God has some things. I just don't know what they are. Um, but my soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. Um, and so God will let me know, you may know the saying, God is rarely early and never late. Um, and so if you're thinking about that, what am I going to do? Who am I going to do it with? Where am I going to do it? Just wait in silence. Your hope is from God. Um, and we'll see. Um, there's a, a popular worship song. Okay, sorry for those of you who have noon classes. I'll, I'll finish up here in a minute. Um, it's called The Goodness of God. A lot of you probably know it. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, first verse goes like this. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And then, excuse me, the chorus goes like this. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I'd like to say a prayer for you as we close. Um, this prayer is mostly not my work, but I'm going to cite my source. Uh, this is a prayer that actually is a combination with some slight editing on my part of two different prayers that the Apostle Paul offered for his dear friends, the Ephesians, in his letter to them because he cared so deeply about them. And so this is my prayer for you, um, uh, adapted from Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Please pray with me. I pray for you, foresters, when you come to those times in your lives, when you cry out, I don't know, I ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, even if that calling is just a sentence in your head as it was for me. I pray that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, in his incomparably great power for us who believe, power that sustains us through any circumstances. After all, God exerted that power when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things including those unexpected shocks and uncertainties, under his feet and appointed Jesus Christ to be head over everything for the church, which is us. We are his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every, every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.